some really big questions just now in Sunday Live. And today, this is maybe the, the biggest question of all. It's one that I certainly hear often. If God is so good, why doesn't he stop all the suffering? If God is so good, why doesn't he stop all the suffering? There's plenty of suffering around, isn't there? And, and I think that's more obvious than ever just now in the midst of a pandemic. So what's God's role in the midst of all of that suffering? Different religions will have different answers to that. So if you are a Hindu, you will see it in terms of payback or, or karma. So the suffering that you go through in your present life balances out the uh, bad stuff that you have done in a previous life. Or if you are a Buddhist, you will see suffering as being an illusion and you only suffer because you have not been able to fully detach yourself from that illusion. If you're a Muslim, you'll see suffering as something that is um, completely determined by the will of Allah. And actually, the Islamic approach to suffering is quite similar to, <coughs> to excuse me, a, an ancient Greek idea. Aristotle talked about God as the unmoved mover, the God who himself is unmoved by our suffering. And then something that is quite common in our own society would be a, an atheist view that says that suffering is, well, it's just what you expect in a universe in which there is no creator, no design. It's just a result of, to use Rick, Richard Dawkins' famous phrase, blind, pitiless indifference. So this evening we're going to unpack a Christian view on suffering. We're, we're not going to provide all the answers. We're, we're hardly going to scratch the surface, really. But do you know... Suffering is often presented as a uniquely Christian dilemma. And it's set up as a dilemma like this. You've got assumption number one, an all-powerful God would be able to end suffering. Assumption number two, an all-loving God would want to end suffering. Conclusion, if he doesn't end suffering, then he is either not loving or not powerful. And that can seem like an irresistible logic until you maybe start to scratch at the surface of it. And you look at that second assumption, say, you know, an all-loving God would, not want to, would want to end suffering. Well, could there be times when suffering actually has a role in God's loving purposes? So you could set it up like this instead and say, number one, an all-powerful God exists. Number two, an all-loving God exists. Conclusion, so God must have loving reasons for permitting suffering, and he must be able to achieve what he wants within these loving reasons. One thing that I'd like to share some thoughts on, uh, firstly, was this idea that Bill mentioned before, that often um, people think of this, this karma idea where the uh, people experience bad things if you've done bad things, um, where bad things happen to bad people or bad things come of bad decision making. And for the most part, um, that can, well, sometimes that can be true. I think that often pain or suffering can be, can be a direct response. For example, if I were to put my hand uh, over a hot flame, or if I were to put my hand in, into, a, into a hot oven and I would burn myself, then obviously that's a uh, a direct um, infliction of pain from uh, a bad decision that I've made. Um, I think also one thing that people say is that it's easy to look at Adam and Eve uh, in the perfect Garden of Eden and say, but if, if God hadn't put the tree with the knowledge of good and evil into the garden in the first place, then we wouldn't have this pain, this suffering in the world. And that is true, but consider this. By putting the tree in the Garden of Eden, what God did was he gave Adam and Eve a choice. They didn't have to just blindly 
obey God, but they could choose to obey God, they could choose to honour God, or they could choose to act selfishly and do their own thing. And it's that freedom that defines our humanity without being able to, without being able to decide for ourselves we're just highly sophisticated robots. If, if God didn't give us a choice to love him or intervene just because, just before, or intervened just before any human did anything that was unloving to someone else, uh, we could accuse God of being this tyrannical overlord that just dictates everything we say and do. So instead, God gives us free will. And this freedom is to choose how to act and how to be around one another, what we do and what we say. So with this free will, we can choose to love God and we can choose to love others, or we can choose to live for ourselves and live selfishly. And often people choose with their own free will to inflict suffering on other people. It's not often that we've done something to deserve it, but whether it be bullying in the school playground or if it's World War II, there was so, so much suffering without provocation. I'm not saying that uh, by any stretch that they're right to use their free will in that way. Absolutely not. But is it fair to blame God to, when you consider the suffering that Adolf Hitler inflicted on people by persecuting so many Jews and having them executed? Without free will, our world becomes a bland, repetitive cycle where all of our interactions lose their sentiment and their meaning because God's telling us to do it, or worse, God's forcing us to do it. From that perspective, the earth becomes the universe's largest doll's house where God is just um, manipulating each and every one of us. So Jesus said, I have come so that you may have life in all of its fullness. And fullness of life isn't being told what to do. It isn't being made to do something. It's choosing for yourself. And often that can mean learning from our mistakes. But it's not that God sets us up to fail by giving us choices. Because he sent Jesus as a human example. He gave us the Bible, an incredible instruction manual to live by too, and he sends the Holy Spirit to live inside us and help to guide our conscience. So we can use all of these tools to help us in choosing to live the way that God originally intended for God's original purpose of loving him and loving each other. Thanks, Josh. Yeah, that, that reminds me a little bit of a, a scene from Bruce Almighty, where God is uh, handing his power over to Bruce, and he says, there's, there's, there's just one rule, you can't mess with free will. Yeah. And, and Bruce said, can I ask why? And God said, yes, you can. That's the <laughs> beauty of it. But yeah. having said that, wouldn't the world just be much better without any suffering, without any pain? I mean, on the surface, probably yes. You'd say, well, actually, yeah, if, if we don't suffer any bad things, then that's, then that's great. Mm. But I don't know if you've seen the TV show The Good Place, or if you yeah. have either, Emma, that um, The Good Place, uh, very, very quickly, uh, it explores this idea that when, when humans die, they go to either the good place, this perfect paradise, or they go to the bad place, which is quite the opposite, as you can imagine. And so one of the interesting things that that, uh, that show explores is that once the people who have been in the good place have been there and they've had all of their hopes and dreams filled and they've got all of their favourite things, all of their favourite foods, all of their favourite activities, activities every single day, every single minute of every single day, they've got nothing to work towards. And so over time, it all becomes quite samey and quite boring. And I don't believe that, that God wants us to live boring lives. You know, as I said before, Jesus said we come to experience life in all of its fullness. And that does mean that, that we do have to 
feel pain and suffering to understand what the good feelings of joy and of love are because without that comparison we don't get the the light and the shade of of real life mm. some profound thoughts there <laughs> <laughs> thanks josh i'm going to pass the baton uh, over to emma to to look at how how does god's work through suffering what does that look like yeah and i think that's a really important thing to to consider um in this because suffering is never easy um whether it is you who is suffering or whether you're watching someone else suffer um when we're going through it it is all consuming or it certainly feels all consuming so how does god work through that um, and I think a really good place to start is um, in the New Testament so in the second half of the Bible and in uh, the book of the second Corinthians where it says this praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. Now, as much as we, we don't know and we don't understand why some people suffer more than others, um, but we can be sure of, of one thing, um, and that is that God is with us in, in our suffering. He is a God of compassion, and he is always ready to offer that comfort to us when we need it. Now, comfort from God doesn't mean that the suffering will disappear. It just means that God is with us and we can be sure that God is with us. He is walking that journey of suffering with us. So we aren't alone and we can always turn to God because he is always ready to hear. Mm. Okay, so it's it's comforting to know that that god is with us in our suffering that god has that god is at work through our suffering but how is it fair mm. if someone deliberately causes suffering and they get away with it how how is that <laughs> fair um okay well i feel like that's it's a tough question and i think um there have to be a, a a couple of points that we consider within this. And I guess I want to start with um, the fact that I am not God, you are not God, and none of us are, apart from God himself, none of us have um, the same ability or the same power as him. And so as much as it often pains us to not see um, a perpetrator of suffering suffer themselves, I think we need to consider the fact that we don't know uh, everything about someone's life um, and often I think we can perceive that someone isn't suffering um, and that they are in fact kind of getting away with it um, kind of with their behavior and with their treatment of others but just because we perceive it that way doesn't mean they actually are getting away with it um, we don't know every detail of someone's life and we don't know if they are and so with it, we need to consider that someone may suffer, a perpetrator of suffering may be suffering, but not in the way that we want or the way that we expect. And we certainly might not see it either. So I think that's that's something worth considering. Um, and I think another point worth considering is that maybe the perpetrator of suffering isn't isn't suffering at all in their life and they are just getting away with it, but this doesn't, as much as this doesn't provide kind of uh, an immediate comfort, um, I have the knowledge and I have the trust um, and I know that God is a God of justice. Um, and so as much as um, the justice might not happen in my lifetime, at some point, justice will happen um, because it tells us that God casts his judgment on all people. So all people will be judged. Um, and on that day, when there are people who have purposefully caused suffering to others, they will face the anger of God. God will show his anger against them. And we, we have to know that. Now, 
And I keep saying it, but God is a God of justice. It's what the Bible tells us. And so this doesn't um, necessarily happen in a way um, that we want it or the way that we expect. But God does promise justice and he does promise that those people will pay for their actions. And then I guess finally, the other kind of part of it that I want to address is that I I clearly believe in God. I clearly have a relationship um, with God, but I'm also aware that some people listening and kind of watching this, they might be thinking, well, that's okay for you because you do have that belief and that certainty, but I, I don't yet. And then I'm sat here saying that we might not see it in our lifetime, but God will have the final say in it. Honestly, I think I think I would really struggle um, when it comes to kind of perpetrators of suffering, because life would just seem really, really unfair. But knowing that God does have the final say, this isn't it's not a crutch or a get out clause for me, but it is hope. It is hope in that I'm believing and trusting God that when it comes to suffering, there is hope. There is hope for justice. There has to be hope for justice. Otherwise, this world is just ridiculously unfair. And so my belief and my relationship with God and when he says that he's a God of justice and he will have the final say, then I have to have hope that that is true um, and that that must prevail for me. Mm. Thanks, Emma. There's some really yeah. um, helpful perspective there, just, just seeing that actually we don't see all of the answers, at least this side of eternity, we don't. Um, and that recognition that God plays a long game, but recognizing that mm -hmm. his love is also shown in justice, that he's that, that God of justice as well, and, and holding on to that. So we've had um, one question and one comment has, uh, has come in. So um, here's one for you, Josh. What's the difference between temptation and God's testing? And how do you know? Oh, OK. Um, tempting, I suppose, is something that we very much see in Genesis, in the Garden of Eden, with Adam and Eve, where the devil directly tempts Adam and Eve to eat the fruit that God told them not to, and that leads down, I mean, what's now, you know, now known as the fall and, and evil and sin coming into the world. So temptation comes from the devil and leads us away from God, whereas God's testing comes from God and leads us to him. So it may be a... Um, it may be a testing of faith, it may be a testing of courage, it may be a testing of love, of generosity, but ultimately the end is a good, a positive outcome, whereas, mm. the, whereas temptation comes from the devil and leads us into, it might be into pride, it might be into selfishness, it might be into self-pity, it might be into greed, um, that would be... Yeah, so the purpose is different and the end is different. Mm. Yeah. So if it, if it helps you to define something that you're struggling with, where is it going? Where's the outcome? Uh, is it, are you, it doesn't mean to say that God can't use temptation for his good, mm. but um, yeah, how, how are you growing? How is it changing you through what you're experiencing? Mm. Thank you. Uh, and then uh, a comment where someone says, I like this reflection by C.S. Lewis. Pain insists upon being attended to. God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our consciences, but shouts in, in, his, in our pains. It is his megaphone to, a deaf, to rouse a deaf world. Um, yeah, and I, and I think that's, that's so true. And... It ties in with what you were saying, Josh, about how you know how how are you growing in all of this? And I've I've heard so many Christians and read of so many Christians who have said that 
actually, if it wasn't for suffering, they wouldn't have grown spiritually, they wouldn't have grown as a person mm. um, in the same way. And, uh, and there's something really significant in that. And someone says here, um, also complaining that God has apparently overlooked someone else's wrongs reminds me a little bit of the parable of the workers in the vineyard. Um, so this was a um, this was a story that um, that Jesus told where um, where people were uh, where a, a vineyard owner um, took people on at nine in the morning and then he took some more people on at twelve and at three and then uh, at four in the afternoon and they came to be paid and he paid the people who only worked one hour the same amount as he paid the people who'd worked for the, the whole heat of the day. And um, the, some of the workers complained and the, the vineyard owner said, well, am, am, am I not right to be generous with what I have given? Um, so I guess that the point here is, is something of, of God's grace and that actually, um, you know, if we complain about other people, then there are things that we need to look at in ourselves as well because none of us is perfect before a holy God. Um, and uh, uh, oh, so, oh, there's more here. The comment goes on to say, uh, so in a sense, it isn't for us to complain about how God treats other people and grants them grace. We only have responsibility for our own behavior. So thank you very much for these um, thoughts and uh, comments and questions. We've looked at a Christian response to suffering through the lens of free will. We've looked briefly at how God works in the midst of suffering. And that maybe just starts to answer, starts to just scratch away at the question, why? Why does suffering happen? But sometimes when it comes to suffering, the the question isn't why, but it's, it's where. God, where are you in the midst of all of this? And here is where I think Christianity has, what, has one of its most incredible contributions. And it's the understanding that God himself has wounds. Do you remember earlier on, I mentioned that in, in Muslim thought, in Islamic thought, God is the unmoved mover. He moves everything but is, unmo but is himself moved by nothing. And in contrast, Christianity says that God, God is moved. He's moved by our sufferings, a place in the Psalms that says he stores up our tears in a bottle. Um, and he is a God who suffers himself. And that's, a, that's one huge point of contrast between um, Islam and Christianity, the idea of the God of wounds. There's a, a Jewish writer um, by the name of uh, Elie Wiesel, and, and he was a, a Holocaust survivor, and he wrote about some of the things that he himself had personally experienced. And he, t he wrote about a young boy who was hanged in a concentration camp. And it's very poignant and moving what he says. The SS hanged two Jewish men and a youth in front of the whole camp. The men died quickly, but the death throes of the youth lasted for half an hour. Where is God? Where is he? asked someone behind me. As the youth still hung in torment in the noose after a long time, I heard the man cry again, Where is God now? And I heard a voice in myself answer, Where is he? He is here. He is hanging on the gallows. In the final moments of Jesus' life, as he was weakened by all the blood loss and he struggled to get any oxygen into his body because of asphyxiation. In these moments, shortly before he died, he searched for words to express his feeling. And he reached out for some words that he knew well from Psalm 22, which are, my God, my God, 
Why have you forsaken me? Shortly after the Second World War, a poet by the name of Edward Shulito wrote a poem called Jesus of the Scars. And he, he wrote this. The other gods were strong, but thou wast weak. They rode, but thou didst stumble to a throne. But to our wounds, only God's wounds can speak. And not a God has wounds, but thou alone. This picture of, of suffering of the wounded God speaks into our wounds. And then this picture of the wounded God does something even deeper. It brings us an invitation to mercy. So here's something even, even more incredible than the wounded God. In this God-forsaken moment on the cross, Jesus loaded onto himself all of the God-forsakenness that, that I deserve for rejecting my maker and for not loving others as myself. Um, the Bible's shorthand for that is sin. So Jesus' death is God's invitation to experience not just his mercy, but his comfort. And in coming to Jesus, we get to know the God who is with us. And then to see him make a difference through us to the suffering around us. So, Josh, Emma, we've, we've, talked, uh, we've talked a fair bit about different approaches to suffering, but just to, just to turn it personal for a moment, mm. um, what, what helps you in the face of suffering? What, what is it that when you go through times of, of difficulty, of suffering, what is it that, that helps you to stay in a good place with that? How about you, Emma? Um, I, I think to begin with, um, I think I, I always have to remember that God can take it. Like God is, God is bigger than me um, and God can take it. So as much as I have that kind of prior knowledge and I know it's rooted in my heart, that God will never leave me. He is always there. Um, just because I know the comfort of God doesn't necessarily take away the pain sometimes that you feel when you're suffering. And um, I learned a long time ago that God can take whatever I have got to throw at him. So in those times when, when suffering is almost unbearable and yeah, you, I don't, you don't know how to pray. You don't know how to do any of that kind of stuff. I have found myself um, telling God exactly what I think of him. Um, and, and sometimes that's not, that's not always nice, lovely things because of the pain that you feel. And, um, and I learned really early on that because God is big, so God can take whatever we throw at him. But it means that we get to be honest. And I think God would rather I throw what I, my anger at him than not say anything. God would rather I be angry, I be furious, I be upset, I say whatever I need to say at God. He would rather hit anything and not communicate with him because what happens in silence is often uh, a wedge appears when when you stay silent with someone who you're meant to have a relationship with. And, and I think God would rather hear what I think and what I have to say, even if that's not nice. And so because I am rooted in that knowledge that God loves me um, and that he never leaves me. So even when I don't see him doing anything or I don't feel that God is near me, um, I know I can be honest with him. I know that I can tell him um, exactly what I think of him because God would rather I communicate with him than go silent on him. Does that make sense? Does that's maybe yeah. not an answer that people yeah, definitely. were expecting, the, but does that make sense? It, it does. Yeah. And there's, there's a lot, there's a lot in the Bible that, that points to that, that the Psalms are full of 
sometimes ranting mm. <laughs> at God, uh, but within that, yeah. just the, the recognition, as you say, that, um, that God can, can take that and, and, you know, that out of that venting to him, it's, it's a process yeah. of communication and we, we can start to work through some of the, the grief, the pain that suffering Absolutely. brings. Yeah. How about you, Josh? Yeah, I think, as, as Emma says, coming to God is, is a really key thing, particularly for me. I like to squash down my own feelings. I like to ignore. If it's not what I want to be feeling, then I'll try and ignore it. And so actually coming to God, um, even when you don't know what to say, and telling him how you feel. For me, I would express myself, I know I've said before on a sun, on Sunday Live, through music. And, and so what sometimes what I will do is I will, I will sit and I will play and I will sing whatever comes into my head because I just don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. But if you're feeling pain, that's totally okay. Um, we, have to, we have to experience good and bad things to experience all things. And so it's okay, it's not wrong to feel pain. It's not wrong to feel angry at God. If you, if you come to God, you can work with him through it. And so, uh, like Emma says, where she rants and shouts, or I sing, um, or if you pray, but pray silently in your head, Talking to God is is the key element because that relationship is what God wants with you. Mm. Um, God wants with all of us. And so when when we feel happy or when we feel sad, we share that with our friends and our family. And so and God wants just the same. God knows you better than you know yourself. God knows me far better than I know myself and any of my friends or any of my family know me. Mm. So. I would say, um, yeah, coming to God and expressing yourself, regardless of what that is, um, God can yeah. take it, like Emma said. Yeah. And I, th I think for me, in times of, of suffering, of loss, of, of grief, of pain, it's more than anything else, it's that knowledge that God is with me. And sometimes that's, that's a heart knowledge and there's a there's a comfort and an awareness of the presence and the closeness of God that, as you say, doesn't take away the pain, but, but brings a real, a real <coughs> comfort. But sometimes that, that feeling is just not there. There are times in suffering when it just feels desolating, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and in these times, the knowledge, it's not always there in my feelings but it's there in the faith that recognizes that God has been with me through my life thus far, and he's seen me through times of suffering, and, and he's promised in the Bible, and, and I'm holding on to these promises. And another thing that I find helpful at times of significant suffering is, is Christian community. It's just, you know, it's not going alone. Um, and I know there have been times when I've just just even found it difficult to to pray because you know that can remind you of the of the pain that you're that you're going through and and at these times to have friends around who say look i'm struggling can you just pray for me and to know that they are yeah. lovingly holding me before god that's uh, i think that's worth its weight in gold you know that's that's a really mm. precious thing uh josh and emma and i would like to pray for you and in particular if you are going through suffering yourself we want to pray for God's blessing for God's strength for God's help for you so let's pray loving God we pray for every person watching this who is going through suffering where there's pain please bring your comfort where there's anxiety, please bring your peace. Where there's anger, please bring your reassurance. Where there's weakness, please bring your strength. Make your presence and your love real to each person who's suffering today. 
Lord, there's so much we don't know and the reasons for our suffering are often hidden. Help us to trust you in all that we don't understand. Help us to know that there's nowhere we can go that you don't go with us. That whatever we go through, you're right there beside us. Thank you that we don't come to a God who is indifferent to what we go through, but to the one who enters into our suffering. Jesus, you know what it's like to suffer physically, emotionally, spiritually. You know what it's like to go through pain, rejection, injustice. Thank you that on the cross you suffered for us. And now you're with us in our own suffering. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a, as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. Loving God, thank you for the hope that we have for the future. In all we don't know, help us to trust you and to know that you will never leave us and never forsake us. Amen. Amen. So next week, our big question is, if faith in Jesus transforms people, how come there are so many bad Christians? And... I've realized what I'm just about to do. <laughs> yeah, you, you got it. I, I'm saying, how come there are so many bad Christians? And our guest next week is Bob Jevons, <laughs> who is a very good man and Absolutely. a very good Christian. And he will be helping us to unpack this question. If, if faith in Jesus transforms people, how come there are so many bad Christians? Um, thanks to uh, Tim and Simon for being virtually with us. Um, thanks, Emma, for um, being with us from, uh, from home. The, the Zoom link worked really well. It was just one or two little, small, wobbly moments, wobbles, but, but yeah. it, it did Held all right. Um, and to, jo to Josh yeah. and to James over there on the desk, thank you very much. Um, as mm -hmm. ever, please like the video because that helps other people to find it. Um, please subscribe to our channel and then you can get um, all of our good stuff, including some, um, some lockdown um, videos that, that Emma has been producing. Um, and, uh, and, as, and as ever, tickle that notification bell and we'll look forward to seeing you next week. Good night. God bless you.